I promise I will only take a few minutes of your time. I would like to show you my watch. It's, uh, it's a bit old fashioned. You don't often see a pocket watch these days. I have no clue as to its age. The chain is new. I, I added that myself some years ago. I enjoy the relaxing rhythm as it swings backwards and forwards. As you can see, the design of the watch is rather dull. There are no intricate engravings. The numbers 1 to 12 sit plain and black with only monotonous little dots marking the seconds and minutes between. There is no hint of a manufacturer's name on the face. Its origins are as obscure as its age. Sometimes I, I think of it more as a, as a contraption than a watch. Sometimes I, I think of it more as a creature. Are you curious now? <laughs> be patient and all will be revealed. But indulge me for a moment. Let me tell you how the watch first came to be in my possession. In my younger days, I drifted into a life of petty crime. My father had died in the Great War, and I guess I could think of no better way than thieving to put food on the table for my poor mother. I found I had a penchant for picking pockets. Nimble fingers, you see. I would travel up and down on the Bakerloo line from Baker Street to Elephant and Castle, stealthily dipping into purses and pockets. Dressed in my favoured disguise as a nondescript apprentice boy, I would drop these pilfered prizes into what outwardly appeared to be a little canvas tool bag. I would count my tally later. One night on a crowded carriage, I was drawn to a well-dressed gentleman. I was sure from his haughty demeanour and the scent of his expensive cologne that he was bound to have a fat wallet or a silver cigar case ripe for the plucking. He was holding on to, uh, to one, of the, one of the metal poles and the the side of his hand intimately brushed that of a young woman dressed in the uniform of a shop assistant. Although I know now what he was up to, I was ignorant then. I wasn't sure if he was flirting or planning something more sinister. That he was distracted was all that mattered to me. Stealthily, I sidled up behind him, pretending to look in the other direction. I waited till the carriage jolted slightly, then dipped my hand deep into his jacket pocket. My fingers curled around something round and cold and heavy. The carriage jolted again and I swiftly withdrew my hand, dropped the object in my bag and moved away from the man all at the same time. We were approaching Piccadilly Circus when I first saw him check his jacket. His face turned pale, then creased in fury. Thief! He shouted, Thief! Somebody has stolen my watch! Everyone began looking around, casting suspicious glances at their fellow passengers. I knew from previous experience that the best way to avoid drawing attention to myself was to do likewise. The train pulled into the platform, the doors hissed open and passengers began streaming off. I spotted a young man not much older than myself in the crowd. Him! I accused, pointing at the youth. And staring my victim square in the face, I said, I saw him! He put his hands in your pockets! The man barged through the crowd and grabbed the youth by the collar and as the onlookers gathered round, I made my escape up the wooden escalator. Later, when I held the stolen watch in my hand, 
it seemed somehow to pulse as if it might actually be alive. I held it to my ear. I heard the mechanisms tick, tick, ticking like the panicking heart of a tiny mouse. Looking over my shoulder to make sure no one was watching, I slipped it into my pocket. I was 17 years old at the time. But even then, I was energized by a surge of youthfulness, as if all the time accumulated in the watch had somehow inexplicably rushed into me. Now, you're beginning to doubt my word. You're thinking he should look older than he does. You're thinking it's not possible for someone who was 17 at the end of the Great War to still have the looks of a middle-aged man. You're doubting my motives. Don't worry. My days of picking pockets are long gone. As I said, I, I just want to tell you about my watch. And I promise I truly will take nothing but a few minutes of your time. I feel you're getting impatient. You're thinking, when's he going to get to the point? So let me cut to the chase and tell you what happened when I got home and I first glimpsed the strangeness with which this marvellous device is imbued. You haven't been up to your usual shenanigans again, have you? Asked my mother as soon as I got through the door. Ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies, I said, trying to be smart. She blinked back tears. It's just that I worry so. It's all right, Ma, I assured her, and, and we fell into a hug. Over her shoulder, I noticed that the watch had, had somehow got into my hand. I think I maybe intended to show it to her. As we embraced, I noticed something strange. The second hand on the watch seemed to be ticking backwards. I watched as it ticked past the little dots, first three, then two, then one, and I felt the same <coughs> disconcerting invigoration that I felt when I first held the watch in my hand. Somewhat unsettled, I unraveled myself from my mother's embrace slipped the watch into my pocket and kissed her on the forehead. Later, I sat in the backyard, stroking our neighbour's cat as it purred contentedly on my lap. I held the watch in my other hand, completely enthralled. I watched as it ticked back a full ten minutes before I shooed the cat away. No sooner had it jumped down, and the hands on the watch once more moved in the correct order. I felt full of renewed energy. A beetle scurried past. I snatched it up and, and held it between my thumb and forefinger. The hands on the watch once more ran backwards. I watched for 17 minutes and 21 seconds till the beetle's churning legs fell still. I dropped the dark husk to the ground, and the hands once again moved forwards. The watch felt a little heavier. I don't know if it was the dark of the sunset, but my eyes were playing tricks on me, but it, it seemed somehow bloated. I sat and watched as it deflated and got lighter and I felt such a buzz that I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the time stolen from the cat and the beetle had flowed right into me. In that moment I was tempted to fetch my father's old tools from the cupboard under the stairs and, and try and prise off the back plate but a sobering thought stayed my hand. What if there was a little heart nestled there. What if tiny organs and entrails fell out instead of 
brass cogs and copper wheels. To this day, that unsettling thought has prevented me from investigating further. In the weeks that followed, I experimented with the watch on the tube and, and the trap, surreptitiously reaching out to rest a solitary finger on a fellow passenger, watching as the hands ran backwards, the time from my victims flowing into me through this eerie, vicarious conduit that appeared to be mine to command. My thoughts turned to the gentleman on the Bakerloo line. I speculated that he was an inventor of sorts. <laughs> there, there were a lot of scare stories around at that time of, uh, of Bolshevik spies. What if the watch was a weapon devised by the Soviets? What if they wanted it back? What if they were on my trail right at this minute? I near drove myself to distraction. <laughs> Even now I find myself speculating endlessly on, on the watch's origins. But the sum total of what I know now is the sum total of what I knew then, other than what it could do. Of course, any more hugs for my mother were completely out of the question. She was the closest person to me, and the thought of the amount of her time that could potentially be accidentally siphoned from her terrified me. I don't think she ever came to terms with how cold I became towards her. But I made it up to her, on her deathbed, in the, uh, the last month of 1949. Riddled with cancer, the morphine doing little to halt the agonizing spasms of pain that would shoot through her body, I sat at her bedside and held her hand. Towards the end, I saw her glance over at the watch in my other hand, and a, a flicker of understanding seemed to pass through her roomy eyes. She smiled up at me and, and sighed her last breath. I looked at my watch. I had saved her one hour and 46 minutes of unnecessary suffering that I had added the same amount of time to my own personal tally brought me no joy whatsoever. I've lived alone since my mother died. I cannot contemplate taking a wife, let alone becoming a father. What sort of person would put those that he loves at such risk, shortening their lives with every hug and kiss that would be expected of a husband or, or a father? Sometimes in my uh, lonelier moments, I, I think this watch has been a curse upon me. I have lived far longer than I could otherwise have expected to. I can afford the youthful outlook of one who has plenty of time. I exist on stolen time, and I, I know I have years before the amount of time I've already accumulated becomes close to having run out. But it is a life without hope of intimacy or companionship. The closest comparison I can draw is to, is to that of an addict. I crave time. I spend all my time in the pursuit of time. Nothing matters more to me than the accumulation of time, and I, I have no time for anything else. <laughs> I take my watch with me to the theatre, to uh, football games, political rallies, Oxford Street at Christmas time, <laughs> anywhere where large unsuspecting crowds might gather. I travel during the rush hour. I glide amongst the commuters with the sly grace that I developed as a pickpocket, taking a minute here and a minute there from everyone I touch. It's such a small amount of time that it, it makes no difference to them, but it makes all the difference in the world to me. It, it quells my appetite and, and, and quenches my thirst. 
On a good day, I can amass a full day's worth of minutes. For every day I live, I add an extra day to my longevity. I have long since given up contemplating ridding myself of my watch. And the dreadful burden that it places upon me, I live with. It would be like cutting off my own hand. We are content with one another, my watch and I. The ticking of its mechanism has, has synchronised with the rhythm of my heart. Time binds us together. So, now you know what little there is to know about my watch. Didn't take long, did it? But what I've neglected to tell you is why I added the chain. Although you have no recollection of this, I should make you aware that as I recounted my tale, you were enthralled by the hypnotic influence of the pendulous back and forth motion. As a consequence, you were not conscious of me passing amongst you, placing a hand on each of you. But you will recall that right from the outset, I promised take no more than a few minutes of your time. Mm -hmm.